Time is 4.30. We will call the Board of Commissioners meeting for scheduled PUD to order and ask that you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Aye. Aye. Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 All right, so at this time, uh, we will look for a motion to approve the consent agenda items one through six. So moved. I second. Motion a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that is adopted. And moving on to our next item, the Water Use Efficiency Public Forum. And looks like Mark Semerow is presenting. Hey, good afternoon. Today we are moving closer to completing our water system plan. One of the planning requirements is for us to conduct a public forum to establish water use efficiency goals for the next six to 10 years. So our mission is to provide our customers with high quality water services at an affordable price. Our vision is to be an outstanding regional leader and innovative utility provider. So our core values include quality, environmental stewardship, and financial prudence. With regards to water use efficiency, we can see that it is easy um, to see that environmental stewardship is certainly a, a plays into this, but um, the other two core values also play into this. Um, eliminating pipeline leaks reduces the potential for contamination to enter our distribution system, maintaining our quality. Also, water that leaks from our distribution system does not generate revenue, impacting our financial sustainability. So we're going to start with some background and objectives. So water use efficiency is a collection of strategies and measures to reduce the quantity of water produced and consumed. The first part, the production of water, is our responsibility. The second part, consumption of water, primarily involves our customers. Water use efficiency programs involve planning, which includes collecting data on current water usage, forecasting future demands, and identifying areas of improvement. Next, it includes goal setting, specific reduction targets and measurable metrics. Once the program is developed, measures will be implemented to promote efficient practices, invest in water saving initiatives, and replace leaking water pipes. Once the program is started, ongoing monitoring will track water usage and losses. Finally, we report our program results to the Department of Health and our customers. So the objective today is to review our current water use efficiency program. Next, we will review drivers that impact water consumption. And finally, we'll establish water use efficiency goals through a public decision-making process. Some of the strategies and measurements. So past water use efficiency programs have incorporated nine program elements. These are the minimum required number of elements for a water system of our size. We, pro um, we propose including these same nine elements in our up upcoming water use efficiency program. Public outreach can take many forms, such as our bi-monthly newsletter, our website, and our social media platforms. There are also several community events, like chamber and city council meetings, other public forums, event sponsorships, and tours of our Judy Water Treatment Plant. These opportunities allow the PUD to engage in a variety of discussion topics, including conservation of water resources, protecting watersheds, and water conservation practices. 
Our school outreach program involves classroom curriculum, tours at the Judy Water Trailer Plant, and science fairs. These opportunities focus on the value of water, the hydrologic cycle, and the need to protect our drinking water sources. The PUD provides kits, devices, and other paraphernalia. Indoor water fixture retrofit kits are available for purchase. These kits include a low flow shower head and faucet aerators for the kitchen and bathroom. Toilet leak kits can help customers replace worn flush tank parts that may be leaking. Also available are leak detection dye tablets that help customers determine if the tank is leaking. Shower timers are a popular giveaway item that the PUD provides at some of their events. The shower timers are set for five minutes and condition customers to take shorter showers. Soil moisture meters help customers conserve water through information-based irrigation practices. Rain barrels are available for customers to purchase and are typically used for small irrigation applications. Occasionally, customers experience leaks on their side of the meter. PUD staff assists customers with meter shutoffs, water usage history, providing contacts for leak repair, and customer follow-up. Consumption history for the past two years is provided on our customer bills. This information helps customers make informed choices about managing their water use, including implementing conservation efforts. There are water use dry, um, efficiency drivers that the PUD itself implements through its ongoing operations. Leaking pipes result in water loss that directly impact operational costs. Also, a leaking pipe can become a broken pipe, resulting in property damage and considerable water loss. Replacing leaking pipes results in more water available to be sold to customers. The data-driven pipeline replacement program will identify pipes at risk of leaking or breaking and schedule them for replacement. Accurate metering is essential in water management. Our large meters are calibrated on a three-year cycle. Regarding water rates, the PUD already uses an increasing block rate structure intended to encourage water use efficiency. The PUD also has differential rates between our residential customers, commercial users, and agricultural-based enterprises. Additional measures could include adjusting rates based on seasonal demands. These activities collectively contribute to the PUD's water use efficiency by minimizing losses, promoting accurate measurements, and encouraging responsible consumption. External water use drivers are elements that do not involve the PUD, but do have an impact on water conservation and efficiency. Water sense Fixtures can be purchased from local retailers and installed by customers. These fixtures are high performing water efficient products that help reduce water consumption, meeting EPA's water efficiency and performance specifications. Building and plumbing codes are moving toward water use efficiency for new and remodeled construction. The LEADS program integrates water conservation principles into building design and operation by encouraging water efficient design for new and remodeled constructions. Some companies find it advantageous to incorporate these, incorporate these design elements. People are slowly adopting a conservation mindset that may include water conservation. The desire for lush green lawns seems to be waning. Conservation initiatives may consist of installing efficient irrigation systems, replacing lawns with drought resistant landscaping, or just not watering your lawns at all. Weather patterns vary yearly, resulting in different water usage demands. Wetter colder summers result in less water use. 
while hotter, drier summers increase water consumption. So some rec this is our recommendations based on what we've come up with. So based on our recommended water use efficiency program, we propose two goals for discussion. The first goal is customer focused. It is based on our equivalent residential unit calculation, specifically to reduce the consumption from 146 gallons per day currently to 138 gallons per day by 2030 and 136 gallons per day in 2034. The second goal is PUD focused. It is to maintain our distribution system leakage three year running or rolling average to 10% or less of water supplied. As you can see here on this graph, um, water consumption has been trending down over the past 15 or 16 years. Those are the, the dots on the, on the left-hand side. And we project that to continue on uh, we anticipate the trend will continue in the near future, but possibly in the far, um, in the distant horizon, we could be leveling out from a efficiency standpoint from using this metric. So that concludes our presentation and I would like it open up to the floor for discussion mm -hmm. and public input. All right, any discussion? For the three-year rolling average for 10% or less water supplied um, for system leakage, um, how have we done in the past years? Uh, are we trending in the right direction? Have yeah, we been above 10 in the last? We have, we, we, we kind of hover around 10. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're above it, sometimes we're below it, specifically with the Judy system. The satellite systems have much more variability um, because there's just a, a smaller base so a, a, if we have a significant leak or break in those um, systems, then that is negatively affects our uh, distribution system losses because a break does not is considered loss. So it's it's on the other side of the equation than we, we want it to be on. And if we're above ten percent, what are the regulatory requirements that we have to other hoops that we have to jump through? Um, if yeah, we're above that target, you have to. You have to provide, you have to implement more programmatic efforts toward reducing that. When we do flushing and stuff, does that count in that 10%? Flushing is considered authorized use. Okay. So you can, so they monitor how much they are flushing each time and they, right. and they could record that and we include that in the calculation. So, cause that's, that's a, an authorized use. So, okay. but then, a, a leak, but leakage and pipe breaks are not authorized use. And how do we do, like uh, fire flow? Like if there are hydrants being utilized in an again, that's an authorized use. Much more harder for us to estimate. Yeah. Um, because sometimes we don't even know about it. We may, if it's a really large fire, we'll notice by just drawdowns in storage tanks. Operations will get alarms going off, things like that. Pressure, like um, pressure, pressure issues. issues. Yeah. So um, we may we may know about a larger fire. Um, I'm trying to think about ways to try to get that. Uh, we know that about four percent of all emergency vehicle, you know, calls, you know, emergency calls result in water being used for, in a firefighting situation. So if we could just know the number of calls per year within all the fire districts that we serve. Um, we might be able to and then take 4% of that and say, okay, that's how much we're using water and then make some sort of an estimate as to, you know, is it like 10,000 gallons or per, per usage type of thing and try to make a better estimate. Cause that is the one area that we've noticed that really is kind of just a wag at yeah. the end of the year. Do you, so there's some, there are some that are factored into that metric. Then there could be some of that ten percent. Yeah, we, we make that. an estimate, but it's not a very educated estimate. Okay. And so I'm trying to think about ways that we could improve estimating that that aspect. We just don't have the information directly um, available to us, but maybe a fire 
the a fire marshal, a county fire marshal might have that information that might help us estimate that a bit better. So then in essence, our, our historical distribution system leakage factor or percentage has probably been overestimated because of that in sense. Could be. Could be. Could be. Yeah. Right. Well, I love the concreteness in number one in the reducing consumption. Um, I the part that I'm struggling with is I'm just unpacking. I again as a target, I think it's phenomenal. And then it's how much of that can we can control? And so I, I as a, in creating goals, it's like okay, <laughs> if we can't control it, it's just like I really want the Seahawks to win the Super Bowl. Sure <laughs> you know, I, I have so little can I can watch well, every you game. You get the rates right, yell and yes, exactly. <laughs> and so it just turns into if we can. That's in terms of objectives and key results. It's like I just want to make sure that all the key results are the behaviors that we and activities that we can influence are. Yeah, correct. so that's kind of why I brought in the external yeah. part of this in this presentation was to let you know there's other things outside of what we do sure. that are probably making the most impact. Our our effort with our customers is very limited. Um, obviously, the one way we can do that is with rates, and um, and they even say that in the in the program documentation they say. Your rates have to be set at a at a level that encourages water efficiency, um, but understand that there is a trade off between setting rates high for water use efficiency and providing rates that are affordable. Yeah. So um, you could you know there there are some people that can't afford the rates now. And so raising the rates doesn't mean they're gonna conserve more water. They're already conserving the most. And then there's other people that, I don't care how much you raise the rates, I'm gonna use as much water as I want. Mm -hmm. So um, so there's that trade-off and that's, that's that's a difficult place to be in. What were the, um, the reductions? Were they based on so that's based on the curve of the graph that you saw. Okay. So basically just taking that center line, it's okay. obviously going to be variable every year. That's the uh, the seasonal variations or the summer, you know, dry summer versus wet summer um, is going to, it, hopefully it'll be within those two red lines. Those are the, the five percentile and the 95 percentile. So 90% of all data going forward should fall in between those two red lines. Um, and they should trend ideally trend with that that projection that goes out um you know that obviously if it doesn't then you go back and you reanalyze your what's going on with the system but, so instead of maybe having a concrete number would you feel more like if it was the range within that 95 percent confidence that maybe that range would provide us with like the most confidence rather than having one concrete value. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. So yeah, no, that, that's a good one. And the other is that it's often it's the outlier. It's like three data point outliers that skew the whole thing, right? There's mm -hmm. yeah. everybody's in compliance and then there's four or five people that just don't care. And then that can throw <laughs> your whole target off where it's like, okay, well, we need another set of, of solutions for the outlier outliers that are drying, you know, uh, and, and disproportionate amount of our intention away from the objective. That's that's another kind of floating concern where it's like, you can do really, really well. It's like, oh, look, he's, you know, there's a, a group of outliers that can really mess this up. And I think it just kind of gets back to the, the I love it as a, as a, a, a set of solutions and strategies and activities to, to draw this down. I'm just and I know I'm quibbling. Yeah, it's just I've I've seen it. They're like, okay, well, did you hit your mark? No, and then it's a thirty minute conversation about things that we could. And here are all of the marks that we hit. We've actually improved overall system outcomes, but we didn't say that up front, so it looks like a miss. Yeah. So for us, the second goal is a target we have to work on. Yeah. The first goal is not necessary. If we don't meet the first goal, that's not really on us. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we don't really have to make any adjustments per se um, if we don't meet that first target. The second target is 
Obviously. Well, and the good news is that's entirely within our control. Yeah. The second, the, the second one. I, the first one, again, it, it, it just. You're talking about the customer one. Yeah, customer yeah one. That's, that's the one. I yeah, think. and I think that if we get those... to a point, you know, if you get to a point where you're not reducing at all, you know, you're flatlining or increasing, then there are consequences for that. But we are we don't forecast that. With the advent of you know every old house that's torn down and a new one built in its place gets water use efficiency fixtures, so that's just automatically going to uh, contribute to our this goal of reducing water consumption per year. And I think, and I just am not the the I hate drilling down. I don't want to double click on it too much, but it also feels like if like instead of that statement, it really needs to be a paragraph, right? Mm -hmm. Here are all weird. Here's what we know. Here's what we're doing about it. To me, especially at a, at a more political, it's just easier for us in our, when we get cornered at Fred Meyer about what we're doing about this, that, or the other, there's three facts and a, and a principle that we can draw out to be able to say, yeah, actually, here's what we're doing. And you can check it out. And that's not, doesn't make your lives easier. And I'm not trying to make our lives easier at that expense, but to be able to say, here's, we, we acknowledge that, but we all, here's, and here's where we're working on that without, said if we're going to set it as a mark and we miss it then that's that doesn't feel as good at least for this chair mm -hmm. i think it's important for the we can't control i mean getting back to the one that matters is the second one that's the one where you can turn around and say tell me a story about how well we're doing in this space and we've got all the time in the world and i think it's important to remember it's a goal it's not i mean that's what we're shooting for and that's what's been trended out and trending I think, I mean, what we, I think, don't want to get to is a, something where we're mandating, you know, mm -hmm. you can't irrigate, you're right. going to irrigate every other day. If your address ends in an odd number, you irrigate on odd number days, or if it, you know, vice versa. No. I mean, I mean, Seattle, that's where Seattle, King County went to, right? Was, you know, that's, that's how they were accomplishing it because they were bumping up against their, water production in the 1980s um, but then they they drastically turned it around since 1990 they dropped like 22 percent of their their demand and, as in addition to keep continuing growing within right. their service area they, yet their demand has dropped 22 percent over the past 30 years so um you know so that i don't know that we want to get to that level of management so um, we'll want to keep track of that. But it, I think it only will come into play if we just aren't reducing it at all. You know, if we show a flat line. I know this might be, I, I just look at the, especially when it comes to things that we can control, um, going back to how we have really improved our, it seems, our um, leak rate, um, that maybe, maybe a little bit more focus um, on historic versus current um averages yeah or, so or say if we're if, say if we're start becoming consistently over the 10 percent mm -hmm. rolling average then we just need to it may be an operationally we have to get our leak detection gear out there much more you know like dedicate two people to just doing that all the time identifying where leaks are and going replace and going and fixing those leaks you know right now we don't really have an active leak detection program ongoing we have we have places where we you know we have some places where I, I might identify an area i'm concerned about this place ask operations to go out and do some studies in that area um, but it's not like ongoing every day type of thing so that that's where we that's what we things that we might have to do if we don't continue to get under 10 percent okay i i think i just meant like um and thank you for explaining that as well. But um, maybe to just focus on how we have improved and within this, I don't know if that's something that would be to show we were above 10 at one point. Our goal is to stay where we are in this now current three year rolling average that we're at nine point, is it 9.7? 9 9 uh, I think this, that that was through the 2022. We've included 2023 now. I think we're at 9.9. .9. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're kind of, we are really. Yeah, we are. So like I say, we, uh, <laughs> we, I think we've been, at high, I think the highest I've ever seen was 11. Oh, okay. Um, so we did change one of the calculators. 
Yes, we have the the categories that made that. We did, yeah. Oh, okay. That makes a big difference. In line, the proper calculation. Yeah. Yeah, we we realized we weren't accounting for something correctly. And so once we made the adjustments, then it kind of bumped us up a bit. Oh, okay. So, but you know, we all that that's also including a couple of years where we had huge breaks in the transmission line. Oh, you know, okay. so uh, you, we're we're still that three year rolling average is still including that those water losses. So if we once we get those rolled off, then hopefully we'll okay we'll start. Which is also useful as we talk about, you know, funding Cost, yeah. uh, deferred maintenance and Absolutely. those are lagging indicators from decisions that were made a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And as we improved and made adjustments and we can expect those to improve. And when they do, great. Yay. Yeah. When they don't, okay. if they don't, then it's yeah. find out more. Well, that's a good point too. In our capital replacement replacement strategy is to target leaks, not just age of pipe. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. hopefully that will help. Yeah. So that's our business risk model that we're developing. Yeah. And that's going to basically put together for us a capital improvement program to replace those pipes that are at risk of leaking or breaking. I will say that is something reading through this I was extremely impressed by was the integration of GIS and City Works to kind of utilize data to really drive our decisions as more so than, oh, age and type of pipe, it must need replaced. And I mean, now that we have these tools and we're implementing them in such an efficient manner, it's very impressive. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate getting to read that and being like, oh, we're doing so good. <laughs> well done. Thanks. Mark, what, did, what do you need? Do I need oh, do we need to do, do I need to actually <laughs> officially open a public hearing then? I <laughs> well, you can. I think at this point you can offer for public comments. Okay. Um, yeah. So if there's, anybody time, if there's anyone from the public that wishes to speak, come to the podium. Uh, if there's anyone on Zoom wishing to speak, raise your hand. Seeing none. Okay, we will close the public hearing then. So I guess my question is: Is are the goals that are, that were presented? acceptable to the commission at this time. I think so. I'm fine. Now I don't know if we need any kind of legal motion with that or motion to accept the accept the goals as goals. Yeah. I motion to accept the goals as stated for our water efficiency program. Program. Second. Motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We will adopt those as presented. Uh, so at this time, audience comments, if you're here looking to offer public comment, please step to the podium. Again, if you're on Zoom, raise your hand. Seeing none, we will move on to the general manager's report. Thank you, Kevin. There we are. Good evening. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to check out the new building when you drove up. Um, the brick masons are 100% complete and the finished washing and sealing the exterior. So that's how nice it looked on the outside. Yeah. Pretty good, right? Slick. Yeah. Um, they were been pouring the new rear patio slab. Um, the permanent power is in on the building. The electrician hasn't all energized all the permanent circuits yet. The HVAC unit and rooftop generator have been installed. Starting to do some painting inside. It's kind of cool. Um, and the building is just really moving right along. So it's really exciting to see that every day, different change, the irrigation system out here, the plantings. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um a couple different things here too. Um the on Friday, we'll be doing a tour up at Judy Reservoir on the Water Treatment Plant with the AWWA Pacific Northwest Subsection Young Professionals Group. So that'll be nice at three o'clock coming in to learn about the water treatment plant. And I think they're going to refresh later at um, Armstrong down the road. Um, and then tomorrow, I have a tour here of the facility with the new Mount Vernon School District Superintendent, um, bringing him up to speed and the board president. They're interested in looking, continuing looking at the building. And um, so that'll be interesting as the discussion. 
Um, and then customer service, they're planning to launch some new web forms, um, which include a new online um, water service application. Um, and they're gonna be doing this over the next couple of weeks. And hopefully this will help streamline processes and eliminate paper and the phone calls that our CSRs get. I mean, Shannon deserves a lot of credit. She's been doing setting up a lot of the behind the scene processes in Laserfish and conducting training sessions like we did this morning at seven o'clock before they work started, I guess it did start at seven, but um, yeah. So the first forms will go live on Friday. That's kind of exciting to continue to, the website continues to evolve. Awesome. Is yeah. that like a module then with our software or is that? The laser fish forms. Okay. So, um, so like a public portal? Yeah, well, it's a public publish, publicly published <laughs> form. So they'll have a link on the website that allows them to fill out the form. And then it goes through like a whole routing process internally. And we'll send them email and it's processed. Cool, yep. Yeah. yeah, because previously we did not take applications for water service application. We just called up today, we can, I'd like water at this end. So this is all new and we're taking information and be doing it all online. So nice. it's kind of a big move. And Shannon's had to teach me how to create the form. So, <laughs> so we've been working on this for several months to get this going. And then last, um, the Port of Skagit commissioners would like to schedule a joint meeting to discuss the SkagitNet backbone IRU, which is like the long-term leasing and agreement. And they propose like Tuesday, August 13th, with which is a regular commission meeting, but potentially like at 2.30 in the afternoon before our regular meeting at 4.30. And I'm not sure what your availability would be on that day. If you could have a look at your calendars and let Shannon know. That should work for me. Work for me. Work for you guys? Yeah. You okay? It could be good. Okay. Two, for two hours, 2.30 or? Yeah, it, it may not take that long. Well, we're not sure, but um, at least start at 2.30 and then if there's a gap, we'll take a break and then come back. Okay. 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 And that is what I have for the general manager's report. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. All right. Looks like Kathy is up next with the human resources department updates. Hello. Let's see. Oh, thanks, Nick. Okay. So it's been a while since I've given one of these. Okay. So as usual, we'll start with a staffing update. So we have um, some new staff, not a lot, but it's been uh, relatively quiet for a while and level, but it's starting to ramp up again. So we have um, Corey Howard, who started in our maintenance department in April. And we also have um, Cecily Gubitosi, and she's our temp records management assistant. So she's assisting Shannon primarily, but also other departments. I know she's been a help to us with, with our records. Um, and so she was hired in April. And then we've had some promotions and transfers. So Gary Riddle, who is a longtime uh, member of the meter department, was promoted to meter foreman in January. Okay. And then Wendy LaRock, who is sitting here in this meeting, was promoted to project manager environmental compliance in January. So we're very excited for her. And then um, Brandon Murdoch was transferred uh, from our maintenance department to our meter department in um, February. And so he's um, the primary, primarily the reason for that was to focus on the meter installs and also an upcoming retirement and also um, some departmental cross training. So it sounds like he's doing really well. I heard, what did I hear that he did? How many meter installs the other? 78. 78 in one day. So apparently he's a machine but uh, doing really well. And then recently hired, um, we finally filled the asset analyst GIS position that we were really having a challenge uh, trying to fill. It was vacant for a while. So he begins uh, July 15th. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that we poached him from uh, Skagit County, but uh, we were very excited to... <laughs> I'm very excited to um, say that we are bringing him on board, and I know that the department is is very excited to have him. So 
uh, I think that's going to be a great fit. And then current openings right now, we have a water treatment plant operator, so we're advertising for that. Uh, that was a new position that was added. Um, CSR, it's internal posting only for now. We just posted that yesterday. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, because of a medical leave where the person ultimately did not return. Um, we also have um, the yard maintenance uh, tech position that we're going to discuss later in the meeting. Uh, we're not advertising for that yet, but um, hopefully we will be soon. And then water quality technician due to a retirement that just happened last week. So we'll be starting that process. Um, and then we have a retirement that I mentioned. So Al Staniford, um, he was our water quality technician and he was here for 21 years. Um, and so he uh, he did not want a lot of fanfare or a party. So he, uh, he left rather quietly um, on Friday. Uh, and it, we have at least two other anticipated retirements later this year that I know of. So uh, we'll be busy for a while. So it's gonna be a, a busy year with everything we have going on. And then just briefly on employee training, uh, we did our harassment and discrimination in-person training in April. So we held four sessions over two days. Um, and we also held a supervisor supplement training, which included managers, supervisors, superintendents, and foremen, uh, because obviously there's a higher standard of expectation from um, anyone in a supervisory role. Um, the person that, that conducted that was Jennifer Bowman Stegall from Red Kite Rising, and I got nothing but uh, good feedback about her training style. Um, people seemed to feel it was really informative and interactive, but not heavy handed, and it had humor, uh, real life examples for the most part. It's uh, really not easy to make that topic fun or entertaining, and I think that she accomplished that. So, And then we have union bargaining coming up. So likely that will begin in July or August. That typically begins with the union sending us a request to bargain. Um, and we have done a lot of legwork already. Um, I would say that Krista has done a lot of legwork. I was in Scotland when she was doing a lot of this legwork. So I think I got the good end of the deal there. But um, we've gathered a lot of pay comp information and other uh, collective bargaining agreements for reference. So we always try to be as prepared as possible, look for trends with compensation, ancillary benefits and pay, and also um, whatever else they may come up with at the bargaining table. But I, I typically am surprised at least once or twice. So it keeps life interesting. Um, also, we have the wage opener that was uh, written into the uh, customer service uh, CBA also for the fall. They wanted to see what happens with the other groups. So uh, that will be open at some point. And then management and leadership planning sessions. So in an effort, um, in our efforts to stay on track with our strategic plan, we decided to try something new this year. So we had a couple of offsite planning sessions. So we had one on June 4th for um, the leadership team and some key staff, and that was a half day planning session. We did that in Anacortes. And then we had a second one on June 18th with just the management team. And so essentially what that entailed was a deep dive into goals, whether any course corrections were needed now that we're on year two of our updated strategic plan, uh, discuss priorities. So I believe George will be updating the goals and information and we'll be reporting that at a um, future meeting when he's back from his trip. And then benefits. So we had our, um, let's see, dental plan change, which was part of our continuing efforts to provide cost containment while at the same time um, providing the highest level of, of benefits we can for our employees. Picky fingers today. Um, so that was effective June 1st. And it's the same network, uh, which is principal, but it's now self-insured with the Meritas. Uh, we had virtual open houses and a brain shark slideshow to communicate uh, with employees about the change. And it, as far as I know, the change has been virtually seamless. I don't, I think we've just had minimal issues, if any. Um, it, it's, I think it's due to Krista's um, efforts in that regard, but um, it, it seemed to go off without a hitch. So that was always, that's always a good thing. And then upcoming, uh, the next all hands meeting is on uh, July 15th. And then we're also getting into our annual non-rep evaluation cycle, uh, which impacts merit uh, increases. So that's a, um, a big part of our evaluation process. And then also we're planning for the building move. So scanning records, we've already done a lot of work in that area, at least in HR, but it's still gonna be a, a big 
a big process. We're excited, but it's a lot, especially with everything else going on. <clears throat> so that's all I have to talk about, um, unless you guys have any questions for me. No, I just want to comment on I'm, the training was great. She was wonderful, and it was it, she approached it in a way that was very digestible and and entertaining. I, and I know I shouldn't say entertaining, but I don't know. Right. It just it really had real world feel to it, which helped to be more impactful. I thought so too. I mean, I've gone to a lot of different uh, training for that, and I I think hers is one of the best that I've ever seen. So well, yeah, her I like her as a trainer. So. It's a it's a rather dry subject, but it's an important one. She had some good stories though. She did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great story. She did. Yes. I mean, we always have the stories that we can't tell, but I think she picked some really good ones. So very good. All right. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. All right. So final item under old business is we're going to revisit the excessive use hardship grant program that we've been talking about. All right. Good evening. Uh, just wanted to give another opportunity to discuss um, your thoughts on the information that we provided over the last several meetings and by email. Um, I put together that grid that compared the, what do we have, five different um, large events that we were discussing um, using as an example. Um, I did have an opportunity to talk to George before he left, and I know he had spoken with um, some or all of you, um, but this is, again, an opportunity to just discuss ideas, thoughts. Um, I think we all agree that um, the league policy, um, wherever you draw the lines of criteria, you're going to have people on both sides of the fence. As Mark presented earlier today, it, it you know, rates are part of um, the thought process on keeping people to prevent leaks. Also, our policy was implemented to do that specifically too. Um, we want people to be um, incentivized to take care of their pipes because leaks do happen and we all need to be diligent on that. Um, so it all goes hand in hand with trying to conserve water and, and also keeping the rates low for our rate payers. So it's, it's timely to discuss it, but any questions on what was presented or given to you by email or thoughts at this point. Um, it's been a whole month, I think, since we talked about it at the last meeting, but. I'm looking back at your email. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, because I had responded and I, um, I definitely, it's very clear that each situation is, starkly different from the next. And I, I agree that that's trying to address it at the policy level will be very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, something that I, I during COVID there were, I believe we worked with community action. This is something that I had emailed you and you and George about was when there was those funds available in community action with the liaison for um, taking care of providing those funds to qualifying individuals. Um, I feel like that sort of system would be ideal. And as of right now, there's just not federal funds earmarked for that to be done. I know that that's the direction it's going. So I would be, as far as now, we have no say in what happens in the federal government at this point. But um, but hopefully, moving forward, that there is a program that's set into action outside of our rate finances. That would be my ideal perfect world <laughs> yeah. so any any outside funding grants or otherwise that would be specific to help and facilitated through you know say community action or somebody yeah. that that deals with people and provides other services that people who are experiencing this may they may have other resources for them that for us to just say hey we'll adjust your your um bill may not be the end of the road for them right there may they may need to be put into con con connection with community action anyways, as more of a holistic approach for helping them succeed. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I I would hate to start a program that two years from now, the federal government earmarks money for 
that type of relief that then we are kind of duplicating service or Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I kind of get like the nonprofit situation. Um, you know, but there again, it kind of becomes a slippery slope because then you've got that, and then you've got the 94 year old who can't hear. And yeah. you know, so it's, yeah, it's a matter of where do you draw the line. Um, and even though there's not an official program now, we always recommend that they talk to them. So there are nonprofits that sometimes give assistance and it, it may or may not apply to a leak, but oftentimes um, even that program that you're referring to changed over time. And at the end, they were much more lenient on just what their average bill was, what their outstanding balance was. And they actually were doing it almost more like we had you know, $500 that we could just give to people to do their utilities, but it wasn't necessarily like past, it could be in the future even. So um, we did work with them and we continue to always recommend that they at least talk to them, but there's not funding currently available that we're aware of. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. It, philosophically, you know, it's, it's not, it, actually it is the, the tension is to sit here and say that everybody's equal, but not everybody's the same. And so the impacts way differently on the you know the 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 exact same transfer of incidental water is going to impact organizations differently. And so I think it, to me it gets back to I can honestly say that we've we have been as intentional and you have been as creative as possible in bringing solutions to bear. I I am confident in that that that, that we have looked at the options. Mm -hmm. And I really like two of the principles that are coming forward. The one is is the a capped grant of thousand dollars or you know whatever we we land on, um, and and it a with both of them being a once in a five year whatever we land on, we'd be able to say again the the equal part to be able to say that there's a cap grant that can go towards and you've done your repairs and and a, a part of the program. It's not just a, we're going to wave a thousand dollars off your bill. Right to be able to say you're what you've done, you know, to to remedy it, and the other is an incidental water rate, where we turn around and say it. That's the once every it went through, and then that can be used to retroactively and yet equitably address a a, a mishap on the part of a ratepayer. Those are the two that I if I say here I say okay, both of those can be e equally applied. And while the impact will be <clears throat> not the same, but you're saying either a thousand dollar credit or an incidental use. Well, I think it, it, yeah, whichever is is better. I like the idea of creating the options to be able to say, would you like to take the incidental water rate, and that that could be you know if, if once every seven years, you know, five whatever we land on, or the thousand or or both. I don't I don't know because to in my mind, those are the two that that are going to be the most. That are gonna that are the most efficient application of what is I think a uh, a genuine concern or I don't charity is not the right word but it is it is a compassionate approach as an organization to a mishap that not of our our fault yeah. <laughs> right to be able to say it is compassionate it is it is equitable and it can be applied without taking a lot of staff time. Um, that, and again, that's where, it, 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 again, and, and, and from a business problem, if you look at it and say, what's the fastest way that we can compassionately solve a problem that really isn't ours, <laughs> but as a, yeah. as, as a governmentally owned entity, that, that compassion is on us to be able to turn around and say, well, we, we don't do energy, so we can't cut you a check, but here's what we can do. And that's possibly two options to be able to say, run the numbers. And that may be the one math problem that does rely on staff. We can apply a a um, what do you call it a uh, inadvertent discharge rate, or you can take and you, or you, the thousand dollars. Either way, your five your windows your it is open now, or your your runway. You don't get to come back next year and, and pick the other one. Those are two that as I I sat down it. it and you look like the application of 
one of those two standards, you'd be and still require the application kind of as it was presented at the last few years. So were you because I think that yeah, they were applied, they'd apply to have one of those two standards. Yeah, and I, I think that that would this still be based on need or would this be I don't think so. Just just in general. I think it's a five year because the, the need part where it just it's whichever that's, that's too much. Yeah. I've, that, that's the liability. It's more of a judgment than I think our staff is yeah. is but I think you still need to you still, you still need, need some sort of form where there's paperwork. Yes. Oh, we absolutely have to track it, right? I mean, that's the even in an audit, we're not giving the stuff away. What we're yeah. saying is they're gonna articulate what the what the harm. It is, and it's an excessive use, or right? you say inadvertent use. Like, well, I didn't mean to use that water, whether you didn't, whether you left the hose on or the pipe broke. Either way, it's an inadvertent use. Uh, it could be excessive, and to be able to say we kind of take the hardship out of it, yes. and we just say, and it would that result in a lot of other people setting their clocks in every five years? I get to pay down my water bill. I, I don't know. Maybe. I would say that it'd have to be like repair oriented still, still. But I think that's what we were trying to get away from when we changed this initially. So that's where we yeah. came back to the hardship issue. So I think it still needs to be, I mean, it's self-certifying form, but. Wish there was a good way to, to identify unknowingly. Because <laughs> that, that kind of, for me, is. The big one, right? Somebody who's deaf who cannot hear that they have a break, or they're not able-bodied enough to actually physically. It's the unknowing aspect. Is how do you de define that in a consistent, legal manner? You know, so you know something's broken, and you're using the water. That I, I'm sorry. That yeah, I just feel like one man's hardship is another man's rounding error, right? I yeah. Mean, so it it just it, it gets that. Drags us back into, and I love the self certifying. Yes, it was a hardship for me. It's like, okay, that's what you said. So, but it doesn't require judgment on the staff to say, no, that's not a hardship. We're yeah. not going to give you that. Because I think that opens up a, a well, whole host of. I think if they, go through, if they go through the, if they fill out the yeah. form, they're going to get it. Yeah. I don't it's, think that if you fill out the form, bring in your receipt, you go through the trouble of doing this. Yeah. So, so Andrew, are you saying that all of these would then be eligible for that? All five that I sent you would be eligible. The criteria is yeah. you fill it out <laughs> and you've had a hardship and you weren't eligible for a leak adjustment. And now we're saying do this. And there's not going to be a. Oh, we mean retroactively? No. Well, uh, oh, well that's the that's the next that's the next okay. question. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, it, your criteria is, we've already gone through a leak adjustment. All of these were rejected for various reasons, so they didn't qualify for any sort of relief. And so, under that, um, you're saying that they would be eligible for either another thousand, uh, not another thousand, eight thousand, or a rate reduction based on. Just hardship. Uh, hardship. Because this is only the ones that we're talking about. Right. There's an awful lot of others that are also in that. So um, I, I guess that's a different approach to <laughs> making the um, original high consumption more lenient or expanding those parameters. But if we leave those the same, you're just saying that you're yeah, and that's my concern. Uh, is yeah, that we're, it back up. we're yeah. just because yeah. we're only talking about five really, but I got twenty three and more that are on payment plans that would probably also be very interested in considering uh, a hardship. Yeah, because yeah, that's what I yeah because and then I, I in mean, this case it makes it more of a wide open situation than we were in before. Before, yeah, 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 because we were. I mean, your example was leave the hose on. That that's what we were trying to get people not to do, <laughs> right? So, you know, it. Um, hmm. that, that, that's, yeah, that's, like, that's my concern here with this. Is yeah, there's five that we've heard about, but I'm sure you've got a whole other staff. Right? I mean, you could abuse it and just say, "I'm filling my pool and my neighbor's pool," and uh, yeah, come in. Bring and your truck. Bring your water truck. I don't think people would. Yeah. Um, 
but if we don't have any sort of uh, merit-based uh, review of the things, I think that, you know, that would be the extreme. I don't think that's going to happen, but, um, you know, when I compared all these, I, I think there's only one that really jumped out at me um, based on all the criteria. So you had, you know, low income, um, you had hard of hearing, so you had some sort of disability um, versus the others, which were, yeah, they're unfortunate, but should you have known better? Could you have known better? Should somebody have checked on your house? Um, those are good reasons, but not necessarily in yeah. my mind out of that. So it helped in my mind to see the grid, um, but you know where where we would say yes or no to all the other five on here, I guess that's a personal judgment. So that's that's the challenge, I, I guess. So we have me on one end and Andrew on the other. There, there's the bookends on those on just just the examples, just for, for sure. discussion points. I mean, it's easier to to look at something and come to a conclusion than theoretical, I think. But um, yeah, I mean, that's where we started on this is where do you draw the line? And I, I still think that we're um, still chipping away at it. But as uh, it stands right now. Their last step is to appeal to the commissioners. Yeah. I mean, which which is basically the five that we presented in various one person's friend came and the others you've all gotten emails on um, versus the other ones that haven't done that. So that's why I'm saying I got 23 on payment plans right now that haven't gone to that extra effort. The five that we're talking about have, have risen up to at least a little bit more effort on that but um i think you would have more if we just said okay now we have this hardship that it might take a while but there would be others that would and those are the most costly to resolve I mean, if it's getting to our level it's taking our time and energy to resolve something that is functionally not a commission i mean yeah. I don't know, no, i'm not. best position to make those decisions and yet here we are right yeah so, um, yeah, and I get to shade tree lawyer this thing, but Pete, what do you think? I mean, it, it, the two extremes, right? You, it, the problem is, in my experience, is if you try to play the middle, you can get squeezed by both. Well, for sure. And I think what you're aiming for is an equitable adjustment based on a hardship. Right. So, and I, and I, I'm not sure whether you guys are the best situated to be a final arbiter of this, right? I mean, because you can take into consideration something that was here a few weeks ago, the, the church had a, hard, a genuine hardship. And I, so I think that, and there's opportunity for abuse, as we talked about. If you put anything in black and white on a policy, you're going to leave stuff out because you can't cover every yeah. every incident. So how do you find an appeal to the commission? I, I, I honestly don't think you'd be flooded with these requests. I think that you could weed out most of them to staff through staff. And then if it's still a no and they want to appeal, then it would be you. Uh, Three who would weigh the equities to decide if it's a justifiable adjustment based on, I don't know whether it needs to be unforeseeable hardship or uh, a genuine hardship or it's a combination of words. We can, we can put together words to, to give you guys a framework within which to make that decision. That's and I think that's what we need. If we're going to sit up here, and make these decisions. You want a framework. Let's have a framework. But to me, if somebody goes through the effort to come in, get up to the podium, or whether it's on Zoom, but I think you need to appeal in person somehow. Not just send us an email and you know complain about your bill and staff and Absolutely. you know everything else. Yeah, I because think because the people who really do have an equitable. Uh, issue based on hardship they're going to follow through and do that and the people who are trying to scam you aren't going to get in front of you and, and 
So, so I, yeah, generally, I think that's what it should come down to. Then is okay. Are we going to do? You know, is it a twenty-five percent reduction? Is it a thousand dollar credit? Is it some sort of, you know, high usage rate that mm -hmm. we establish? Uh, but I think if they come in here and plead, plead their, their case, plead their case to us, hardship. Yeah. Then you should retain the discretion to make a good, a, a reasonable decision. Yeah. Sorry about that. I mean, I and I thought to me when we first established that and we, you know, talked about it, well, they're going to come and talk to you. Well, and then once they finally did, it was like, well, I don't know how much to yeah. sit by, you know? Well, and who, who am I to say, three of us having a conversation and saying, is this hardship? You know, yeah. I mean, what are we even, what is the premise that we're basing it off of? Is it yeah. un, un, the unknown factor? of what the policy says, you know, unknowingly right. consumption that has been fixed. And so we lean on, well, the policy says unknowingly, you follow the rest of the criteria, we'll grant you an exemption because it's on your, you know, irrigation and not, you know, it was right after the meter or whatever. Um, and you can fold in other considerations on that too. Like what have you done to remedy the situation? Yeah. <clears throat> but it would be nice to know so that we're all on the same page. What we're <laughs> we're not just we're giving everyone's bills and yeah. you know the we can set our own policy that we will only we will only for, our, forgive or whatever the verbiage would be up to this dollar amount. The commission will only has the power to blah up to this dollar amount because I don't want someone to come in. This is where it came down to the phone call, somebody's buddy, come on in and we'll make sure your entire bill gets waived. I don't want any of us to have that level of power. Right. Personally, I don't I don't want, I don't think we should. I think yeah. we should have policies set into play that we're not allowed to do that. So that's my. <laughs> so if I heard you correctly, I'll leave the policy the same for high consumption events. After that, we'll collect data like we've outlined from people as they come in and want the next step for consideration. And then third, we need to come back to you with a maximum amount that we would put in there, either dollar or percentage or rate, some way to calculate a reduction. Is that fair? That's yeah, exactly. thing. I think there uh, definitely needs to be a maximum because again, I don't, I don't want it to ever become the wild west again. That yeah. that we could ever be at anybody's discretion. That yeah. oh, you gave so and so this adjustment, and you only gave me this adjustment. I mean, yeah. it just. So one thing I, I I'd say is it might be a percentage then. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of because a percentage, you know, you're making it easier, and you're saying, you know, it doesn't matter if it's eight thousand or two thousand. It's X percent. So then you're back to, well, it's bigger impact, but again, we can't um, do it. So uh, let's think about that and we'll have all alternatives, I guess. And then I'll, I'll work with Pete on um, verbiage for the policy update, but it'll be like a subsection to the first consumption. Let's go like phase two or whatever we go for that. All right. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you all right. so much. Thanks, we'll go to try. Thank Thanks. All right, next up, we have the letter of understanding between Skagit PUD and the Swinomish tribe for the 2024 seasonal water rights transfers. So I'll just give a quick, the letter was in the memorandum within the packet. And basically, it provides a document for um, how we're operating the SRD um, for 2024 and lifting the pumping restrictions through the title conditions. With just things effect for one year. Um, but it's just, a, just restating um, what we're planning, how we're going to operate um, the SRD. So I think it's in line with um, the seasonal transfer. Um, great transfer that we have for us. We're looking for an action for um, the general manager to sign the letter. I motion to authorize the general manager to sign the letter of understanding between Scott Beauty and Swimish Tribe for 2024 seasonal water transfer. Second. Motion is second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.
imposed. All right, we will get that signed. Next up is the yard maintenance technician and making that position permanent. Looks like Kathy is coming up for that. So I'll just give a brief summary um, for this. So um, nearly every summer for I think at least 30 years, uh, the PUD's hired a temporary part-time yard maintenance tech. Um, it started as the yard bird position and it's been you know yard maintenance, uh, seasonal vegetation management at the reservoir, pump station, PRV sites, and other miscellaneous labor duties. Uh, typically, that would be a new individual each time who would need to be trained on the locations and duties. Um, often, that was a, a university student. So our ability to schedule for the duration of time needed was a real challenge for us. So usually, we would you know supplement with staff from other departments like maintenance, but um, that's really not a good use of their time. Also, our resources to have highly skilled skilled labor, um, mowing and managing vegetation. So um, in 2022, we created a temporary full-time position uh, in order to assess our need for a full-time year-round position. We did a, an MOU with the union and said, you know, we can revert back, but we want to assess and determine whether this is something we can continue uh, year-round. So the person in the position uh, left a couple of months ago, so we didn't get to the full two years, but in the year and a half, it did give us a really good idea of uh, the need for that position. And what we found is that not just uh, vegetation management during the seasonal months, but having a maintenance um, person to do projects at the plant, the admin building and other sites is really helpful for us. And we can definitely keep a person busy for at least 40 plus hours um, a week year round. Um, things include painting, cleaning, pressure washing, building and stocking rain barrels, assisting with the meter maintenance program, um, clearing smaller rights of way and easements, um, and other tasks as needed. And then it, it frees up the time for our skilled um, labor to perform the things that is, is better use of their time. So um, basically, um, the operations department came up with, namely, Ryan Anderson, who's here to answer any specific questions if you have them. Um, they did their due diligence in tracking the hours needed for the tasks week to week, month to month, and the total potential hours per week. So um, we, like I said, we found that we can keep a person busy year round. And um, so thus we're asking to um, add this position as a permanent full-time uh, role at the PUD. And there's no budgetary impact for this year, but if it's approved, we would uh, include it in the uh, budget for 2025 and beyond. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I think one question is, um, for the last couple of months, I'm sure this was probably the least timely portion oh, yeah. of the year for worst, this person. Worst time of the year. Left. I heard that she did a great job, but um, just kind of, I just to reiterate the impacts of not having that position, I think it's important to know how much more strained has your department felt because of that, I feel would be good for the public and us to know about. Sure. Yeah, so the, we have a four person crew, distribution crew, and what we what they have been doing is just rotating on jobs. So we we pushed some of our projects to the side so that we could just go mow some grass and we need some grass at our tank sites. Um, yeah, she set the bar I think pretty well and made our sites look really nice and it was easier to actually for security wise or Defenses, all that stuff are good. We don't worry about intrusion and people and stuff like that. So it's easier to maintain it now. So the, between the vacations and other projects and stuff like that, we can just, yeah, we've kind of prolonged them right now. And just because of that, they've just been rotating through. And But yeah, they're, they're a higher scale, pay scale, people out right on a lost mark, essentially. So that's what we've been always been procrastinating on some of our projects so we can get this stuff taken care of until summertime when grass is burns up because it's growing as much. <laughs> <laughs> but other other stuff, yeah, the treatment plant has not had anyone up there to do what what um, the last person was doing. So maintenance fills in for the bigger stuff, but not not all the other duties. They, so one day a week was minimum is what she was going up there for. They're not, they're not receiving money. So to give you an idea, then because of that, we have the highest um, level um, represented 
staff um, between water treatment plant if they're filling in to do maintenance mm -hmm. at the plant and then uh, distribution uh, for other sites basically performing the tasks that that should be performed by the lowest paid person um, a represented person so it's not not a good use of our resources or time so yeah I think this was pretty clear when we went this direction that you know, we were giving it a two-year trial, but there's mm -hmm. definitely a need for it. And so yeah. Yeah, and we, you know, if if it if it de we determined that it wasn't necessary, we could certainly built in that language so we could revert back and having it be seasonal. But um, we really wanted to take that time to assess and determine whether or not it was necessary, and um, we we really found that it is. So. So. Any other questions? You're looking okay. for a motion. Yes, that would be great. Well, I move that we authorize the creation of this position. The permanent <laughs> yard maintenance yard technician. Yard technician. <laughs> pull it up here. Permanent yard maintenance technician. That's painful watching you do that with your finger. So <laughs> can, <laughs> can I help you? <laughs> yeah, but not only do that. Yeah. Um, I motion that we um, incorporate the yard maintenance technician as a permanent position. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor of saying aye. 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 Thank All you. Right. Yeah, uh, a couple of informational items in there. Uh, we have our the news item in there with uh, the crew at uh, in the top ops competition in Anaheim. So congratulations to them. Uh, any commissioner comments tonight? All right, so this time we will convene an executive session to discuss potential litigation for RCW 42.30.110. Any anticipated action? Right. Estimated time? How much? 15 minutes. 15 estimated time is 15 minutes. So we will reconvene for adjournment at 5.57.